Most of the composers we've been talking about up until now have based their musics on their own ideas, using motifs or tone rows or things like that. But there's another extremely rich source of music for composers to draw upon, and that's the native folk musics of their countries. We've already heard about Rimsky-Korsakov mixing Slavic folk songs into his works, but until now, most of these folk musics have not been treated as serious music at all. But rather, sort of peasant music, something that's common and not particularly well thought of. Well, this isn't, this isn't true for all composers. Bela Bartok, for example. Bela Bartok is Hungarian. He was born in Hungary in 1881. His father died at age seven. His talent as a musician was identified at an early age, and his mom began teaching him how to play the piano. At the age of 17, he was offered a scholarship based on his musical talents at a university in Vienna, but he turned it down. Bartok didn't want to go to Vienna. He didn't want to study in Austria. He wanted to study in his native Hungary because he loved his country. So he decided to stay in Budapest. And it was at this Budapest University that Bartok earned a reputation as a brilliant piano player and also met up with some nationalists. See, in the early 1900s in Budapest and in Hungary in general, there was a big movement going on where everyone was starting to get very excited about the notion of creating a more prominent Hungarian national identity. So he sets out to learn as much about these as he can. He starts asking around, hey, do any of you musicians know any Hungarian folk songs? And what he finds out is, actually, even though they think they do, they don't. See, part of the problem is that musicians travel around a lot, and in their travels, their music had become corrupted or tainted by various influences from other countries, romantic stylings from Liszt, and pop song structure because these musicians were trying to please their audience, and playing straight Hungarian folk songs wherever they went wasn't going to cut it. The problem with this is that this means that the purity of the Hungarian music had been diluted over the years. So Bartok began to look for the real Hungarian music. Where was it to be found? It was to be found with the peasants out in the fields and the countryside of Hungary. So for a couple years, 1904, 1905, Bartok and a friend go out into the fields to meet these peasants and hear them play. And not just hear them play, because one of the things they're taking with them is one of these new devices that Edison has invented, a wax cylinder recorder. And Bartok and his friend record as many of these Hungarian folk songs as they possibly can. They create a library of hundreds of these things. And then Bartok sits down and he transcribes them all. This is much more difficult than it sounds because the reproduction off of these things is not great. And Bartok has to copy them all out by hand. He has to listen to them, play it back, scribble this down, and transcribe what aren't necessarily great recordings and make them legible. Bartok then takes all these Hungarian folk songs and publishes volumes of them. If you go to any good music library, I guarantee you they have at least one shelf devoted solely to Bartok's transcriptions of Hungarian folk songs. They're incredibly remarkable. And not just for the effort that Bartok put in. One of the other exciting things about this is Bartok did something very unique with transcriptions. See, most of the time when composers would work with folk songs, what they would do is they'd hear somebody make a mistake or drop a beat or hit a wrong note, and they would fix it. They'd say, oh, well, if this song's really in this key, they clearly didn't mean to play that note, or if this song is in this rhythm, they wouldn't have dropped that beat. It screws everything up. Bartok transcribed these things as they were actually played. This was a really big deal because the music ended up being much more interesting and much more complicated as a result. In effect, he is the father of a whole new way of studying music that gets to be called ethnomusicology. And this is the study of native folk music in sort of a serious context. In 1907, he's appointed a professor at the Royal Academy in Budapest, teaching piano and composition to the students in his beloved Hungary. He also works on a number of serious pieces of his own, but gives up composition after a while because many of the pieces he turns out are too advanced or too unfamiliar to people, and his great masterpieces just aren't appreciated by the audiences in a way that he would like, and this is extremely depressing for Bartok.
At the end of World War I, Hungary is declared independent of Austria, and Bartok's nationalist music becomes very popular in Hungary. But the success was short-lived due to the new political regime in Hungary, which didn't much care for Bartok. His music was, however, becoming popular elsewhere in Europe. This would have been all well and good for Bartok, except that Hitler was beginning to rise to power, and Bartok didn't like Hitler at all. Bartok didn't like him so much that he would speak out every opportunity he had, basically saying, this guy's a dummy, we can't be following the Germans, this is horrible, we've got to stop it. Well, the problem is that Germany was expanding everywhere in Europe, and Bartok is just this frail little musician, and his friends are starting to say, look, Bela, you've, you've got to kind of tone it down, you're going to get everybody in trouble, and Germany is right next door. So in 1940, Bartok gives up his life leaves his beloved Hungary and moves to the United States. And while he's there, he tries to make a living by touring and playing his music with his wife accompanying him on piano. He gets an honorary doctorate from Columbia and an appointment for folklore research, but he refused to teach composition. He was far from a star. He did not want to make an impact where he went. Didn't, he lacked the self-promoting uh, tendencies of someone like a Wagner. This left him feeling rather isolated, unappreciated, and feeling like he never really got his share. In 1942, Columbia lets him go from the faculty, and not too long after that, he develops leukemia. He dies in New York City at the age of 64. Now, Bartok is known for a couple of other things that are definitely worth talking about. In his fourth string quartet, he invented something that he called the Bartok Pizzicato, known today for short as the Bartok Pits. Now, normal pizzicatos involve the performers just plucking the strings. Dunk! You've heard it many, many times in classical recordings. But the Bartok Pits is much more primitive and wild. He learned this technique from studying the folks in the field. And basically, you pluck the string and let it snap against the soundboard of whatever instrument you're playing. In many ways, it is the precursor to slapping and popping on a bass guitar. So the Red Hot Chili Peppers and almost every funk band since owes a great debt to Bela Bartok. Bartok also loved kids. He loved teaching music to children. He felt that their minds were much more receptive to the new tonalities and strange rhythms that the 20th century music offered them. But kids are hard to teach. They get bored playing scales over and over again. Hey, I get bored playing scales over and over again. So Bartok started creating a series of pedagogical pieces for piano. He wanted to be able to teach his niece how to play piano without making her play scales over and over and over again. So he starts writing pieces. And he does it in a way that's almost like a video game. He starts off with the first piece being very, very simple. Almost anyone can play it. If you can read music and you know where the notes are on the piano, you can make your way through the first piece. And then the second one gets a little harder. And the one after that gets a little harder. And the techniques start getting more and more sophisticated. And by the end of the last volume of these pieces, you're playing music that is the, some of the most challenging piano music ever written. The other interesting thing is since he had to write so many of these pieces, he had to keep it interesting for himself. And he had to do it in such a way that they were providing good exercises for the students. So each one of these pieces is constructed with some little clever idea around it. One of them might be built entirely around half-step intervals. One of them might be built entirely around one particular key or chord. He called all these pieces microcosmos, and they're still used for teaching students piano today. Bartok's ethnomusicology also had a tremendous impact on the world. One young man, many years later after the invention of the tape recorder, was named Alan Lomax, and he decided he wanted to be an ethnomusicologist that captured the songs of the South. He wanted to make sure that all of the slave songs and Negro spirituals weren't lost forever. So he set out through the American South with a tape recorder, making recordings of all these things, amassing a giant library of folk songs, American folk songs. American folk songs derived from Africa. Fascinating stuff. And it's from a recording of these folk songs that one of today's artists gets particularly inspired. Many musicians are always talking about trying to get back to the source. And for much rock and roll, the source is the blues. Well, a fellow named Moby was working on his new album, and he got really excited when somebody sent him a CD that was a collection of some of these Lomax recordings. Moby thinks, this is almost pre-blues. I mean, these are songs that were people singing in the fields, like before there was even electricity. And they've been handed down person to person for generations. 
Moby samples a bunch of them, throws some drum beats under them, and puts out a best-selling record called Play, which really wouldn't have even existed if it weren't for Bella Bartok and his efforts to bring music into the 20th century. <laughs> 